All right, well, first off, thank you, Dale. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Park, for uh, having us here. This is fantastic. We're the first box there, open source hardware, so we'll see who's after us. Um, I'm Phil. Uh, I have a couple different hats. And even in this presentation, I'll keep a couple different hats on. I've tried to keep track of the open source hardware movement the best I've, I can. Uh, sometimes when you're in it, you can't observe it. So uh, Lamore has been part of it. And uh, if you've been at conferences, you know you have to stand up and introduce yourself. We're going to do a little bit, uh, something a little bit different. We're going to uh, point to some of the people when Tim said, who's uh, building the future, who's, in, who's predicting it by building it. Uh, many of them are here. So uh, some of you will be getting a lot of exercise. So just get ready for that. And it's great because you're here all the way through Maker Faire. You're here tonight. You're here tomorrow. You'll be able to meet some of those people. And, uh, and I think you'll see a lot of them have a long history of doing, building, and sharing, and putting out more than they've taken. So do you want to oh, introduce yourself? I'm Lamar Freed. I'm the founder and engineer at Adafruit Industries. And we're an open source hardware company in New York. So we just got into town yesterday. So yeah. and we're excited to speak here. We'll be also be at Maker Faire. Uh, one of my favorite shows is Connections. How many people know this show from James Rick? OK. Yeah. Wasn't it like the best show in the world? And you know, it's like, oh, look, there's a candle wax maker. And then all of a sudden, it's like, that's how we got on the moon. You know, it's like, it's like, wait, what just, what just happened? And so what's going to be really weird is we're going to play that connections game a little bit today. And I think you're going to see the people are the connections. And that's the difference with open source hardware is there's people that are involved. And they're here. You know, this isn't 20 years later looking back. This is happening right now. OK, cool. So I'm going to just start. Like, luckily, Tim actually kind of did a really good introduction. So I'm going to totally breeze through the section and say, you know, open source hardware, which is what we do, is not, some people say, like, wow, you totally invented this thing. And I'm like, absolutely not. We didn't invent this. In fact, it has a really long history. And of course, the history starts with companies like Heathkit in the 50s and 60s. And this is a kit from um, Evil Mad Science. We'll talk about them later. They were building this week. And you know, in the 50s and 60s, there was companies um, such as Heathkit and others that were basically um, giving away instructions on how to build like clock radios and alarms and oscilloscopes and all that. And so there were a lot of hobbyists, a lot of kids were really excited about building their own radios. Sometimes it was even cheaper than buying it. Maybe, you know, I'm not sure exactly how the, the pricing worked, but it was a, it was a popular hobby. And um, a lot of kids, especially in the Palo Alto area, really loved building kits and they really loved learning about electronics. And this is how people kind of got involved in the local community of learning electronics and sharing and hacking. And like Tim said, this is kind of where um, you know, this area especially um, started up as, as the Silicon Valley. People were building stuff together, learning stuff together, and they wanted to say, wow, this is so much fun. Hey, wait, let's like build our own computer, like the Apple computer, which you know, came with schematics and even came with you know, the first board that came into the slots that went to the Apple and Apple II computers. Um, was a prototyping board. You were supposed to go and modify it and hack it and follow schematics. And you could even, uh, I think they even gave away the ROM listing. So you could actually build it yourself if you wanted to, it, although it made more sense to probably just buy a kit or buy a finished computer. And so th the good news is that, you know, definitely all of this hardware and kits and hacking and HP and all this stuff, definitely, you know, and Xerox, of course, and Apple all started building hardware. But what happened is that there sort of seemed to be a, a social, um, uh, change from building hardware and radios and stuff to people wanting to do software. Because suddenly everyone had a personal computer, and as, as Tim mentioned, you know, started here, you know, came, went all over the US, everybody suddenly started having a personal computer. And then something really interesting happened, which unfortunately we can't go into detail here, but there's lots of documentation online. Basically, people said, not only do I want to have the computing at home, but I also want to own the software in a, in a sort of a freedom way, right? And this is where open source software came from. And everyone here uses open source software. And if you think about it, that's really, really weird. Like the people who are the best paid individuals in America right now, software engineers, are giving away work for free. And almost everybody here has either contributed or used an open source software project, which is really, really cool. I mean, like, and it's still alive somehow. You'd think that it would have like collapsed by now, but it's actually going stronger than ever. There's more and more open source software than ever. Um, and so this is sort of, you know, that's the prehistory. Um, that's where, you know, I kind of grew up into this sort of culture because I lived in Boston and Brookline and Cambridge. And Boston and Cambridge, not as much now, but it used to be a real hub of um, free software and open source software. The FSF is still there. Um, the EFF used to have an office there. And a lot of people who worked on BSD and Linux and, and all these other open source software projects were in the MIT Cambridge area. And there's a long, long history there as well. So after like convincing them like three years in a row, they finally let me in. And so I went to MIT for six years and then 
ended up at the media lab. And the media lab sort of where I ended up, I was like, well, they, they sort of said, like, here's like two years free, and you can kind of hang out there and do stuff because you got a good grade or something. And while I was at the media lab, I was actually really interested. I ended up living with a bunch of hippies, and we were all going to go to Burning Man. And so at Burning Man, I heard that, like, oh, there's this big flat area, and it's kind of windy, and it's really hard to get from one point to another. So I was like, okay, well, I want to get a bicycle of some sort. But if it's really windy, wouldn't it be good if I had a sail on my bicycle? Right, so I'm biking, and then if it's windy, I put the sail out, and then I can just coast. By the way, this doesn't work very well, but I had this idea, okay? And so I had this idea, and it was the summer, and I was taking time off, and I was like, wow, I, sh I, I had no idea how to build such a thing. And luckily, at this exact like, same month, a bunch of kids at the Media Lab had um, a class they were holding for IAP, and it was like, build your own custom weird bicycle. And I was like, that's so cool. So I called up these three guys and I said, hey, I want to build this like sail bike. And they're like, sure. And they introduced themselves. And this one is um, Tim Anderson. He started one of the first uh, 3D printing companies called Z Corp. And uh, that's one of the bicycles that they built. And my bicycle didn't, build, didn't really work out. I don't have any photos of it. Um, and this is another fellow. This is Saul Griffith, who actually ended up working on helping found Make Magazine. And he was really interested at the time in both building bicycles and also building kites. And they were kind of coming up with this weird new sport that like, they were importing from Australia called kiteboarding. And it was, the idea was, this is like 2000, 2001, and the idea is you'd build these big ass kites and you'd get on a piece of wood and you would like go down the beach. I don't know. Anyway, it was crazy. But there was no information out there on how to build these kites. These were really big kites and there was no information about it because it was just so, so bizarre. So I thought, hey, you know, let's build kites and show people how to build kites and share that information. And this was like just as people started having websites and wikis and like Web 2.0 was like about to start kind of. So the idea of putting information online and sharing it was not that unusual. So like I was kind of hanging out with these guys and I was like trying to build this like total disaster of a bike. And they're like, oh yeah, we're building these kites and, and we're doing this thing. It's like open source kites and like open source hardware. And I was like, that is the coolest thing I have ever heard. So. At the same time, by the way, as I was at the media lab downstairs, three floors up, and I didn't actually hang out with these guys because I was too busy in the basement, um, were uh, these fellows, John Lida, um, Casey Reeves, and Ben Fry. And they kind of had this idea of like graphics was really hard to do. Like if you're doing graphics programming at the time, it just kind of sucked. And they're like, well, we're going to design this new system called processing. And it's going to be open source. And we're going to have to have like an IDE, and the, we're going to take care of all the hard stuff so that people can jump in and just get started and, and learn graphics programming. And like, this was their thesis, basically, or I think it was part, it was part of their thesis. So this was all happening at the same time. And of course, processing is the precursor to wiring, which is the precursor to Arduino. So all this stuff actually was happening all at once. And across the street, not right. at the media lab, but the AI lab, which of course was a much cooler area um, and much more like hardcore, was Andrew Bunny Wang, who's in the audience. All right, Bunny, starting to do our exercise. Stand up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bunny Wang. All right. I would have heard you have Tim and Saul and Eric, but they're not here, so unfortunately. But Their maybe. spirit's here. Their spirit's are Tim here. Tim Anderson's spirit is with all of them. He's probably, be at, they'll definitely be at Maker Faire, yeah. so I don't know if you, if you can probably find them there. And he was working on, I don't know, I guess he was avoiding his thesis, I'm assuming, by hacking Xboxes and figuring out how to like open them up and like decompile this code and like tap into this security bus and basically like blow apart all of Microsoft security and like Microsoft did not like this by the way so we had to self publish this book and what's interesting is of course oh sorry I'll, I'll get to the next slide he ended up starting his own open source hardware company later which we'll talk about we'll be standing up again we'll be standing up again okay. um, and so Eric he's the third guy who was building those kites this was Tim Eric and Saul. Um, he also, I guess, likes to build um, climbing walls in his own home. And eventually we all graduated. We had to get jobs. And uh, Eric ended up starting a company. He went, you know, they went out to San Francisco, and he ended up starting Instructables, which was an OATV-funded startup. And the idea was to make open source hardware-like companies easier by having the documentation really easy to share by having it on Instructables. So this is their website. Which is, it's kind of the beginning of Web 2.0. And uh, their baby doesn't really have three arms. Um, it's, <laughs> it's one of the instructables that you can learn to make uh, you know, a costume like that. But uh, very, it's a very cute kid. Even with three she doesn't really have pointy ears. And she doesn't have pointy ears. But that is, um, I think, in his home where uh, he has a climbing wall. And he yeah. shows you how to, to build that. Um, and, and, and this was cool because it was, this is actually like 2000. This was like 2001 was when I graduated. And now it's like 2003, 2004, 2005. Um, so the cool thing is that all these 
Web 2.0 companies were starting up and like really, I mean, there's some newer companies and like GitHub wasn't around back then. But the idea that you would have communities online sharing information was really, really important. And, you know, I fix it for also sharing documentation and make projects and WordPress and RSS and YouTube and Flickr. These were all really key because if you're building stuff, you want to share it. And it's very hard to share unless you're meeting up in person. So yeah, there, there's ham fests at, at MIT and people would show up and show their projects, but eventually it doesn't scale beyond a bunch of people. And so it was really instrumental to have all of this web technology to help the hardware kind of come up because if you can't show photos and videos, it's very hard to share these projects. Oh, and then now finally we're gonna get back to Bunny. Ha ha, you have to stand up again. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, he's not gonna stand up. Uh, so this is Bunny Wang's um, company that he started. So he, after he you know, graduated, he had to get a job. He said, I'm gonna start my own open source hardware company. And so this company was Chumby and it's basically a Linux alarm clock. And now he's actually working on even more cool stuff like open source, HDMI, decoding, non-decoding, overlay devices like the NETV, which is the middle. And then um, after the tsunami in Japan, he started working on the idea of having an open source hardware radiation detector that was better designed than any other radiation detectors because unfortunately they haven't been redesigned since the 50s. So a lot of really cool stuff is happening from all these people as they, as they spread all over. All right. And so this is where I came in. I was writing for Engadget, and this is, I was like editor number two. And all of a sudden, all these gadgets were getting promoted, and everything was like, oh, wait, let's all go out and buy this stuff. But there wasn't any how-tos. And so at the same time, Popular Science was revamping their how 2.0 section, and my editor uh, was, was Mike Haney. And I started writing about this stuff over and over and over again. And it turned into uh, such an interesting thing. I said, I should start a site called Hack a Day. So I started Hack a Day. And every single day, I would put up a hack, something you could build or share or show. And I remember someone saying, there's no way you'll be able to do a project a day. There's no way that there's enough people making things. Well, now, if you look at the, the blogosphere and everything, there's about 500 posts on Make, 500 posts on <laughs> Hack a Day. There's so many projects that people are doing and sharing that uh, it's hard to keep up with. In fact, we all have uh, plenty of work and plenty of jobs. Um, and at around the same time, um, the Hacks books came out. And I remember when Hackaday came out, I think it was Dale or uh, Rael or Tim, and they said, oh, you know what? We want to do that. That was a good idea. Um, hey, we have this thing. And I don't think Make was called Make. So Dale, you got to stand up for a second. You did, you did Make. Come on, stand up. Mark Fraunfelder <laughs> from Make. Come on. Everyone has to see. All right. Mark Fraunfelder over there. And, uh, and this is some of the early team here. And this was, look at these uh, early brands. Look at, how, look at the alternative future that, that Make could look like, right? <laughs> Um, and it was so interesting to me when they said, oh, we're thinking about doing a, a magazine about this. And I had just heard, well, there's no way you can do a post a day. Well, could you fill a magazine? I thought, this is a horrible idea. Sign me up. <laughs> and around that time, I was, uh, Dale just ba basically gave me the keys to the blog. He said, oh, just make, do whatever you want. And uh, that's actually when I met Lamar. We did a talk at South by Southwest. I needed to find people who were doing open source hardware. This is one of the things I was writing about. And uh, Lamar was one of those people. And I invited her out. And the first thing we decided to do was uh, look at the Bluetooth open interface that iRobot did. And we decided to make a uh, Frogger robot out of a Roomba. And we played real Frogger in uh, traffic. Now, in, in, in Austin during South by Southwest, it's totally acceptable. In fact, uh, the, one of the author of the Can story is up. Daniel right here. And he kind of witnessed this, this one of his first up. projects. And, uh, yeah, there you go. There, there you go. <laughs> and uh, the Bluetooth stuff and the uh, Roomba hacking, Todd Kurt, where are you? Where are you? Right there. there. I saw you. Ha, okay. There you go. Okay. So you're starting to see these people that were, that were part of this. And you know, this is like five or six years ago. And uh, anyways, if we had like a half an hour, we probably could have gotten everybody in the audience to stand yeah, up. Yeah, each we person like has... like 20 minutes, OK? And so um, there's the robot that got ran over. It didn't work out. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, uh, I, I was trying to illustrate what this new maker movement might be. And I got this rotary cell phone from SparkFun. And uh, it was the coolest thing in the world. I'd bring it to conferences, restaurants, and someone would call me. And this rotary phone's just ringing in the middle of the <laughs> table. I said, what is that? And uh, uh, that, was from, that was from SparkFun. And this is one of the things that I think was the easiest tool for me to tell people what the maker movement was about. And uh, Nathan from SparkFun, where are you? Stand on up. And uh, uh, one of the things that SparkFun did that was fantastic is two things. One, they popularized Arduino. Everybody started to get what it was. They became the biggest seller of Arduino right away. They uh, had uh, all this hardware that was before not uh, available to people, breakout boards. And, uh, as this Arduino thing took off, um, Massimo, stand up, one of the founders of the Arduino team. 
it really allowed people to glue ideas together. If you think about all the stuff that you're seeing, it's like, wow, wh how come basements can now tweet? Well, it's usually in Arduinos in there, and it's a very hard thing to explain. But fast forward, I'm going to do some time shifting here. Uh, recently, I wrote an article about why the Arduino won, why it's here to stay. Um, just straight up numbers for the people that are interested out there. 287 Arduino compatibles, over 300 shields. For the VC and the business people out there, if you want a community of people to interact with your device, making it Arduino compatible is a really good idea. And, and you can bug Mossimo about that later. <laughs> um, uh, same time at Make, and I'm going to go through these really fast. Uh, I was in Seattle, Bree Pettis, who is a uh, founder of MakerBot. He was a school teacher doing videos with his classroom and sharing it. And I said, uh, Dale, we have to hire this guy. He's doing like art projects with his students. And uh, as soon as uh, uh, he did a video where he shot a crossbow through a phone, uh, Dale said, OK, we got to get him. And he's a cross between Mr. Rogers and Bill Nye, the science guy. And uh, Bree did all of our weekend projects. And the interesting thing is he went on to found NYC Resistor, which became an incubator for the open source 3D printer MakerBot. Someone here is from MakerBot? All right, stand up. There you go. So you're starting to see all these things are connected. Remember that connection slide? Um, Mitch Altman had this standalone device called the TV Be Gone. I noticed everybody was hacking it. Everyone was starting to do weird stuff with it. And he's connected to me because after, when I wrote my thesis, I had a TV, I, I actually referenced him in my thesis and he somehow found out about it, emailed me and said, that's so cool. And I, when, we make, when Maker Faire came around, I said, hey, let's meet up at yeah. Maker Faire. And uh, so we talked to Mitch, uh, he's not here today, but we talked to him, we said, hey, you know what, if you were to make an open source hardware version of your kit, your kit, you can do that thing that you talked about. You wanted to go around the world and teach people how to do electronics. And he brought that hacker space uh, idea back from Europe, and you see hackerspaces, makerspaces, and fab labs. All, all these things are, are interconnected. And then, of course, Maker Faire comes up. And there's all sorts of people connecting, all these hallway conversations, all the things that Maker Faire um, uh, really took off. The first time I met Chris Anderson was at Lemoore's session where she said 17 steps to run an open source hardware business. And at the end, he went up to us and her and he said, you know, I, I think I can do that. And he did. So now he has DIY drones and he has a 3D robotics company where he does that. And that was uh, what's led on to uh, Geek Dad and a bunch of other things. And also at a Maker Fair, uh, Lenore Wendell, where are you? You're here. There you go. Open source hardware company. Uh, we were talking to Element 14, who has uh, EagleCAD as part of their portfolio, and we said, you know what would be fantastic for the maker movement for open source hardware if there was an open export tool? So this was a conversation, a thing that happened, and that allowed more companies, and especially more people now, to start thinking about what tools are we going to use, what open source hardware uh, methods and, and formats can we use to, to share with each other. And then, of course, open source hardware starts to grow up. Uh, there was enough people to have a summit. Uh, the open source hardware definition was formed, defining what the open source uh, hardware uh, actually is. You share files, it's share alike. The uh, association just formed. And also uh, the two people, uh, Alicia, who's, uh, I don't she's believe she's here, here, but Aya, but Aya's who's here. over, where's Aya? Aya, stand up. Co-chair co of the uh, Open Source Hardware Summit, uh, has a company, Little Bits, Open Source Hardware Company, VCs, by the way, she's looking for funding, very cool company. Uh, and. Uh, all this stuff, uh, I tried to keep track of it the best I could. Uh, in 2011, I was estimating around 300 distinct open source hardware projects. Now there's about 600. The companies that do this, approaching 1 million, 1 million, 10 million, that's all happened. All these companies, so the businesses that actually kind of made the risk to do open source hardware, that's happened. Those, those are real businesses that do real things. And the next stage, because we have to wrap it up here, is what's next, because this is a business conference. And uh, for this project, this was an open source hardware uh, schematic that Lemoore released. It was a for a solar charger, and it uh, was used on Kickstarter to make a project. Now, normally that would be crazy, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe someone's using a design to, to make money off it. But that's what we do in open source hardware. And uh, within the last uh, 24 hours, uh, Jay Silver, are you here? And also Nate, you get to stand up again. So. It, in 24 hours, they got funding for a, uh, I guess the best way to explain it is a keyboard for the world. And you can pretty much control the world with uh, this keyboard that's Arduino compatible. And the funding happened so fast. So as far as businesses goes, and this is the last thing we wanted to, to mention, is it seems like all of this together, all these people that you're seeing, all these people we made stand up, there might be a new model where you have Kickstarter, you have some businesses, and the Kickstarter is the marketing, the pre-sales, and then you have venture capital that may be might come in later. And what happens next, and if you want to. Well, this is an interesting thing, because we were talking about this on the, on the Caltrain, because we know where we are. So that it's very hard for us to know where we're going. But what we do see is that, you know, as we spoke, you know, 
spoke earlier that there is history from where open source hardware comes from. And so looking at open source software, we can see how like, you know, they're like 10, 20 years more along. I mean, they're still around, so that's good. But the question is whether the community that we have, and as you can tell, it's a very small community and very closely tied. How can we keep the community together while still forming these large businesses? Because you know, businesses want money and community want money, but businesses and community, like, they don't often mix very well. So I think the challenge that we have is, can we as, as a community hold ourselves together and not get broken apart into, you know, factions and forking and like, you know, anyone who's been in the open source software world knows that it, you can be, it can be wonderful and it can be kind of sad sometimes that, that people fight even though they have so much in common, more so in common than they have um, differences. And so I think that we're kind of on that cusp of if we can, you know, the, the bubble's getting so big, not bubbles in like a VC bubble, but just the, the, the group of people's getting so big that we have to kind of hold it together. So it's gonna be interesting to see whether in the next five years as, you know, we're starting to reach this peak of open source hardware and companies and businesses and as, as people start seeing that there is so much money um, and so much talent in open source hardware and the maker community, if we can keep it together. Okay, so that was our goal. We tried to compress what open source hardware has been doing for the last 10 years and 20 minutes. Hope we succeeded. And uh, please introduce yourselves to all the people we made stand up and ask them lots of questions about what they're working on next. Set for us.